forged. Uh, they couldn't change who their friends were uh, from the Hollywood years. They made no attempt to, and by the way, they remained their friends. They were able to freely socialize with them once they left the White House. She did want to um, up the elegance of the place. They were coming off um, uh, four very quiet years, the Carter uh, presidency, and in doing so, that's when she got nicked um, with uh, expenditures to to try to, uh, in her view, uh, too much time had lapsed since the last good spiffing that the, uh, the, the social side of the White House had received. Right. Uh, and she, she did get dinged on that quite a bit. But, you know, she did raise private money. This was not taxpayers' dollars. Um, and she felt, and by the way, the Reagan China is still the only complete set of China at the White House. So when you have 150 people for dinner, you now have the same China to serve them on. Um, you know, she got dinged for it, but she recovered. Um, and I think I think the, pe the people let her recover from it. She, she did this great spoof at the National Press Club dinner uh, where she dressed up as a bag lady. And um, and I think after that, uh, Washington sort of gave her a pass. But Washington was very suspicious of these West Coast people. Um, as Michael Beschloss just said before, uh, she set about to make Kay Graham one of her very good friends. And uh, even though her paper was dinging her husband on a daily basis, and uh, so. The art of friendship was really uh, embedded in her. She knew how to do it. She, you know, she forged the kitchen cabinet. How through the carpool line at her kids' school, she met Mary Jane Wick and then Betsy Bloomingdale, and and the kitchen cabinet was born. And um, you know, it was really through these friendships that she paved the way for the president, for Ronald Reagan, to become a great president. One final question. We have Craig Shirley waiting to talk to us. If you look at the White House as kind of a Downton Abbey in our country and uh, the Reagans as the Granthams or the current occupants uh, as the Lord and Lady and everyone else there to serve them, how did they get along with the people who make the White House go? Very well. There wasn't a dry eye left. As a matter of fact, her dear dog, Rex, was named after a White House staffer that she was very close to, Rex Scouton. So uh, it went very deep. Well, thank you so much for sharing your memories uh, with us, former Social Secretary of the White House, Gail Hodges Burke. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Craig Shirley is on the phone. He is a uh, historian who has spent a lot of time looking at, studying, and writing about uh, the Reagan years, among others. Uh, Craig, your thoughts today? Well, uh, obviously very sad, Brian. It's, uh, it's the passing of an era. Uh, friend. Nancy Reagan was not only First Lady. I think she was a great lady. Uh, she understood the role of uh, First Lady. She understood the role of the President. She didn't try to uh, complicate the uh, two. She didn't attend cabinet meetings. She didn't try to set policy. Um, you know, uh, she didn't have her own, you know, uh, uh, her own cabinet, so to speak. She, she understood that, that, that for a healthy nation, we must have a healthy president. And so she uh, did the very important things of uh, you know, making sure that uh, Ronnie was in good spirits, that he was eating, that he was dressed. That, uh, and, but she also said to the book, she wrote me with her, uh, her book, uh, one of the books that I sleep next to the President of the United States, so of course I'm going to let him know what I think of things. And, uh, and she did, but to his credit and to her credit, they never really talked about you know, her advice to him. Uh, she, she, she didn't get involved in personnel occasionally, like for instance, uh, she was had a hand in forcing the ouster of Reagan's campaign manager in 1980, and then later uh, the ouster of uh, Don Reagan as uh, Reagan's uh, chief of staff in uh, 1987. But, but she's, you know, her, she understood you know, that uh, his legacy was important, so she devoted himself. And of course, her greatest role of all was uh, caretaker in his uh, later years. It was almost like an old Henry novel in that she was giving a part of herself uh, in order to uh, in order to save him. Of course, the more we change as a nation, the more we remain the same. Uh, as you remind me of how many times she was criticized for perceived meddling in policy and government affairs. Here we are in this modern day and age. Uh, our current First Lady, Michelle Obama, uh, criticized by a ton of people for, quote, meddling with uh, 
school lunches and, and kind of um, uh, right. advising America we need to improve our diet. Uh, right. As, as I say, the brand is changing all the same. You know, two for one, uh, blue plate uh, special that, uh, that people would get almost a co-presidency, not just Bill, but uh, Hillary as well. She sold herself very much as a, as a uh, policy uh, person and a political person uh, to go along with Bill Clinton. So, yes, uh, times have changed. Uh, yeah, I, I wonder if, um, when was the next First Lady who had the influence on domestic and foreign policy that Nancy Reagan did? And I ask that only because she was thrust into the role of caregiver very early on in her, her husband's presidency, and that forged them really even closer. Yes, it did. Uh, and don't forget, too, is that they, they walked into, uh, and, and you remember, you were here at the time, I was here at the time, uh, into what was uh, basically behind enemy lines in Washington, D.C. The, the Washington political classes didn't like the Reagans, they didn't like the way they dressed, didn't like their social skills, didn't like their friends. Uh, and there was a lot of criticism from the style section of the Washington Post, so it was very personal, uh, and from uh, other media outlets. So they, they, so in a way, it drew them even closer away uh, than they already had been. But, you know, Brian, is that Stu Spencer once told me he was going on a political trip with, uh, you remember Stu Reagan's old Tony Blake? He was going on a political trip with Reagan, and uh, Nancy drove them to the LA uh, train station. And the three of them got out, and uh, they went into the lobby, and, and Nancy and Ronald Reagan embraced, and businessmen and businesswomen are coming and going, skycaps are coming and going, newspaper boys are coming and going, and the two of them are there embracing uh, tenderly, oblivious to the world around them. And in many ways, that was kind of the story of their life, is that they could be utterly completely content with each other um, without the company of anybody else. Still getting used to the image of Nancy Reagan driving to the train station. Craig Shirley, uh, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much for joining us by telephone. Thank you, Brian. Um, uh, General Barry McCaffrey is also with us, and uh, you would be right to ask what a retired uh, Army four-star general, a professional warrior, is doing on this day when we're all reacting to the death of Nancy Reagan. Let's not forget something else very key to the resume of public service uh, that General McCaffrey has amassed, and that is former drug czar of the United States, uh, a, a title that's been shortened to drug czar. I think it was uh, director of uh, anti-drug policy. Uh, but General McCaffrey, it's in, it's in that context. I'd love to know your thoughts about the former First Lady. Well, certainly both in national security, which uh, we've already discussed, she played an important role. And it, we ought to underscore, remember, she was a major factor along with Secretary Baker in pushing the president to, to break the Cold War with the Russians. But put that aside, when it comes to drug policy, you know, at the time, she was enormously criticized and in later years on the whole notion of just say no. And yet, when you look at all the research and the success we've had over the years in the drug issue, the key is adolescence. So instead of, you know, underscoring law enforcement policy or international interdiction efforts, she said, let's talk to children, let's educate them, let's understand that if you get a kid to age 18, 19, reasonably drug free, they're safe for the rest of their life. So I think she was an extremely positive influence. And current research really underscores that whole notion. You know, Brian, the, the, the slogan I used to use was, if you want to fight a war on drugs, sit down at your kitchen table and talk to your own children. That was Nancy Reagan. And, of course, it's, it stands to reason that just say no uh, would be perfectly valid advice. Why do you think it was, in the years hence, so roundly mocked? Well, I think that sort of thing still goes on. You may remember another uh, ad at the time, television ad, was your brain on drugs and a couple of flying, crying eggs, and uh, that was just ludicrous in the mind of the drug legalization community. And yet we know perfectly well, you know, I just went to a dinner at the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, Advisors, and we, we absolutely know that if you use a lot of these mind-altering substances, you end up changing the neurochemistry of the brain. And so, you know, I think Nancy Reagan, 